Well, howdy, everybody. Welcome, welcome, one and all. My name is Jason. This is Redfish Bluefish. This is the channel where we examine art, nature, and science through the lens of the aquarist. As you're well aware, we like to do a little thing uh, at least once a week when we, uh, when we do our live streams. We like to pay tribute to the, uh, the early birds, as we call them. These are the top 10 people that show up in chat participating, saying hi back and forth, you know, long before the live stream even began. So before I get started with uh, this episode's top 10 early bird shout out, just want to say that from here on out, <clears throat> what we'll be doing is what I will be doing is I will make sure that I show up at 8 a.m. in chat every time. Now, I start my broadcast every Saturday at 10 a.m. Pacific. So what I'm saying is basically I will be in chat two hours early every single live stream, and that is when we're going to start kind of looking for those early birds. So without any further delay, this time we're going to jump right in and start off with this episode's top 10 early bird shout out. Let me get in the right window, of course. That would help. There we go. That's better. In first place this time, we have Jeeps and Things. My brother, thank you so much for showing up so early. I, I really appreciate you being here, showing the, the support. I'm really happy that you guys way down in Texas way have gotten your power back on and everything's kind of getting back to normal. Thank you so much. So first place goes to Jeeps and Things. Second place goes to Color Guppies. Thank you so much, Color Guppies. I really appreciate it. Third place goes to EJ Fishes 76. EJ, you're here every time. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, EJ Fishes 76. Fourth place this time goes to Brad, Mr. Fish, sir. Thank you so much, Mr. Fish, sir. I appreciate you coming by and showing your support. Fifth place goes to Maria Z, good friend of mine out on the East Coast. Maria Z, thank you so much for being here so early and for your support. Sixth place goes to Kyle's Aquarimetrics. Kyle's Aquarimetrics takes six. Thank you so much, Kyle. I appreciate it. And I did see your comment. Not to worry, not to fret. We're going to do some cool quarantine tank science this episode. Hopefully, it'll help you out. Seventh place this time goes to Kevin Leong. Kevin, thank you so much. I, I, uh, I actually, part of this uh, episode, I put together uh, based off of questions you were asking after uh, last week's live stream. So Kevin, thank you so much for your participation. Eighth place goes to Geek Boy. Thank you so much, Geek Boy. I appreciate it. Ninth place goes to Paul Soltero. Thank you so much, Paul. I really appreciate your support. Last but certainly not least, tenth place goes to Sandy Dowdy, thank you so much, Sandy. I did see your comment there on how to pronounce your last name, and I think I've done a pretty good job so far. Guys, if you didn't crack the, uh, the top 10 early bird this time, please don't worry. I appreciate each and every one of you guys being here. It's just kind of a little bit of a fun thing that we started a while back, and uh, I think people enjoy it. Looks like we have 24 in just now, and I really appreciate that. Okay, guys, so this episode, we're going to get uh, stuck in to showing you guys how to set up kind of an on-demand quarantine tank, one that uses a special kind of filtration that's not at all impacted by various medications that you can and probably will be using in a quarantine tank scenario. However, before we get started with the main um, topic of today's live stream, I want to let you guys know something kind of funny that happened. So this morning, uh, on the way to the shop, I stopped at a little place to, uh, to pick up some breakfast. Uh, they open kind of early. It's a local place, a little cafe. You can get coffee, tacos, burritos, that sort of thing, croissants, what have you. <clears throat> so I ordered a little something and some coffee. Anyway, on the way in, I looked down and I saw they had the local newspaper on their front doorstep, kind of folded in half inside of clear plastic. And I was looking at the bottom half of the front page, and I saw that there was a story on the front page. And two words st stuck out at me, like, immediately. And the two words in the title were, fish nerd. And then I realized that the man in the photograph I was looking at was me. So I was very shocked <laughs> 
to see that uh, I was on the front page of the local newspaper here on Whidbey Island, South Whidbey Island. And let me tell you uh, how that came about. Um, I was in the shop about three days ago, three or four days ago working. I was, I had just gotten in because I had gotten an email notification saying, uh, you know, um, UPS is on their way to drop off some stuff and they'll, you know, be there X, Y, whatever. And I thought, oh no, uh, I didn't realize I had anything coming in this early. So I rushed to the shop and I got here, right? And um, all of a sudden there's a knock at the door. I, I was here maybe 15, 20 minutes. There was a knock at the door and I kind of assumed it was UPS here to drop some stuff off. Um, it wasn't. Uh, it was, it was a, a female, a, a woman, very polite, kind woman wearing a mask and uh, she had a camera you know, with her. And I thought, oh, this is, you know, a lot of people come out to Green Bank Farm because we have a National Audubon Society birding trail and there's wetlands over here. It's really beautiful scenery and a lot of people come out here and bring cameras and spend a lot of time photographing nature, the nice pond we have, stuff like that. Um, so I thought, you know, oh, it's just someone looking to buy some fish, um, just happens to have a camera. Um, so she kind of introduced herself, said, yeah, I was talking to someone next door and they said, you know, new tropical fish stop, shop. And, and so I just thought I'd stop by and, and check it out. Well, turns out the person was a reporter for the South Whidbey Record and uh, stopped in, took some photographs, maybe spent about a half hour or so chit chatting. And I kind of told her um, my story, you know, where I come from, how I got started with this sort of thing. And uh, lo and behold, uh, first thing this morning, uh, boom, there was a story on the front page of the local newspaper. And it's a story about me and Redfish Bluefish, about the shop that's opening up here. And I thought that it would be nice to share a link to the story. Now, uh, there doesn't, it doesn't seem to be behind any kind of paywall, which is cool. You guys can check out the story. Um, and uh, I, I think after the fourth or fifth article click, then you will start getting a paywall. But if you guys want to check out the story, it's here online. Now, there is an error at the end of the story. There's a photograph of an epistogramma, and the caption calls it a uh, panda quarry. Uh, it is not a panda quarry. That's a mistake. Uh, but hey, uh, otherwise, the story is really great. They did a great job on it. And uh, let me go on ahead and drop the link here in the comments section so you guys can read it if you'd like. Please don't close the stream, just open it in another tab, please. Here we go. There we go. There's the link for you guys. You should be able to check it out. I think it showed up. Yeah, there we go. Seems to be a little, uh, little bit of a delay on chat uh, this time around, which is a little, little odd. Anyway. Hopefully you guys will get that link. There we go, it's showing up now. Okay guys, so that is a little bit of a, kind of a fun, little bit of a fun news that happened. It's pretty cool. Um, so let's, let's, get on, let's get started with the show. Enough of my, my, my shameless self-promotion. Okay, so the last stream we talked about quarantine tanks and we talked mainly about disease vectors and how plants can absolutely be really good disease vectors for spreading pathogens uh, into your aquarium. Uh, something that plants are particularly good at getting into your aquarium are planaria and hydra. If you end up with hydra in your aquarium, it's almost a sure deal that you, you got it from a plant or, or possibly some hardscape that you moved over. But more often than not, they come from plants. They really like hanging out on plants. So we talked about that during the last live stream. Now that opened up a lot of uh, questions after the live stream. Um, I got some really great questions from some, from some subscribers. I got some really great questions from uh, Kevin Leong, who is in chat right now. And so part of this came about because I realized a lot of hobbyists must be struggling with keeping quarantine tanks up and running. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, why do so many people have such difficulty with quarantine tanks? Well, there's some really, there's some really good reasons for that. Uh, number one, they're rarely, rarely are they always stocked with fish, right? Because it's a quarantine tank. You should only have fish in there uh, that are new arrivals, that are, you just got in and you put them in a quarantine tank and you know, you're, you're observing them, so on and so forth. Uh, they often don't have fish in them 24-7, right? 
So how can they have active, healthy bacterial beds if there aren't always fish in them, feeding them with ammonia, with waste? Well, the answer is they can't. They can't have healthy, robust um, ammonia-eating bacterial beds in their bacterial filtration systems unless there is a constant supply of ammonia. Now, ammonia comes from fish, right? So if you don't have fish in there 24-7, how are you going to have bacterial beds in your filtration always ready to go? You can't. It's not possible. So that's one of the main reasons, one of the two main reasons why people struggle so much with quarantine tanks or hospital tanks, if you prefer to call them that. Uh, some people use quarantine tanks that also double as hospital tanks, meaning they keep it up, they keep it running, but um, fish are not in there unless they're coming in, or rarely if a fish comes down with something and they want to separate it from their community tank, from the other fish in their aquarium, they'll move it into that quarantine tank. But you're still going to run into that problem. If you don't always have fish in there that are always emitting uh, ammonia, how are you going to have a healthy, robust, ready-to-go bacterial bed uh, whenever you need to use fish in there? The answer is you won't. You will not. You will not have uh, healthy, robust uh, biological filtration ready to go. Uh, unless you, you're, you're constantly feeding that bacterial bed. So that's one of the big challenges to maintaining uh, a healthy, robust, always ready to go quarantine tank. Now, the second reason, and this is, I suspect, an even bigger reason why people struggle with maintaining, you know, healthy, ready to go quarantine tanks is that um, they're quarantine tanks, right? Often we're, we're getting fish in and we're putting them in those tanks and often those fish come down with something. Maybe they got a little bit too cold in transport and they come down with ick. Maybe they come down with some kind of a bacterial infection. Maybe it's protozoal. Maybe, maybe they have some internal parasites, some worms or something, right? So you're going to have to treat the fish in that aquarium. So if you've got a biological filter on it, and the fish come in really gnarly with something really bad and you got to hit them with canamycin or some kind of antibiotic, well, there goes your biological filtration bed, right? The antibiotics took them out. And to be clear, not all antibiotics affect biological filtration beds. <clears throat> not all of them do. Erythromycin doesn't really do a whole lot. Um, there are other uh, medications like uh, levamisol that has no effect on bacterial filter beds, but other antibiotics like tetracycline, certainly amoxicillin, some of the, the more harsh, the canamycins, they will affect your biological filter bed in so much that they will kill the bacteria. They're antibiotics, right? So that is the second big reason why people struggle with quarantine tanks. So, so to recap, the first thing that we talked about are, you know, not keeping tanks stocked with fish all the time because they're quarantine tanks, right? Once the fish are healthy, you get them out of there. Well, you're not constantly feeding the bacterial bed. They're going to die. That's going to equal ammonia, okay? Uh, the second thing we talked about, treating your quarantine tank water with antibiotics and chemicals, you know, sodium chloride. Uh, that's, that's a true antifungal medication. It also displays some, some pretty some pretty halfway decent antimicrobial properties towards some bacteria. That will not totally take out your filtration bed, but it does impact it a little bit. So the second reason that people struggle so much with quarantine tanks is that they're, you know, they're nuking this water with antibiotics to, to make these fish healthy again. Sometimes they come in sick. And a lot of those medications will absolutely affect your, your, bacterial, um, your bacterial bed and your filters. Now. Let's move on from there. I want to take a short break before I, you know, uh, go over this way and show you guys how to put together an on-demand DIY uh, quarantine tank that uses a special kind of a hacked filtration system that doesn't get affected at all by medication and, in fact, eats ammonia like a champ. Okay, before we get into uh, showing you guys that, I want to touch on something. There's some... Uh, there's some not very good information out there uh, on how to successfully quarantine fish, okay? I'm not going to credit the information, but it's coming from a pretty big source. Uh, some of, the, inf some of the, the advice is a little bit shocking, in my opinion. Um, the opinion goes like this. 
get your fish in, put them in your quarantine tank, that's all fine. Treat them with this one, two, three med, you know, combo, that's all fine. The meds discussed uh, that they use, that they recommend to use, totally fine. Spot on with the medications. But here's where we run into a problem, and here's where hopefully you guys will have a problem with this, this advice at the end of this live stream. The next piece of advice is this. Don't feed the fish for one week. Yes, don't feed the fish for one week. Okay, let me take a break right there and tell you that is terrible advice. That is terrible advice. Do not follow that advice. Guys, when you get fish in, whether you bought them from a local fish store and you drove 15 miles up the road to your apartment and you put them in your quarantine tank or you ordered them from me or someone else online and they, they shipped to you, they've been in the bag maybe two, three days, Wherever you got your fish, we all have a responsibility, whether they go into a quarantine tank or not, our responsibility should be to immediately start building those fish up, build them up, build up their health, lift them up in terms of health. So it's terrible advice to put a tank or put a fish in a tank for a week, a new tank, it's already stressed out, and then hit it with medications, that's another source of stress, and then let's not feed it for a whole week. That's bad advice. You need to feed your animals, you need to feed your fish, your shrimp, your plants, whether they are in quarantine or not. Now I get it why the advice is out there, don't feed them for a week. Well, because frankly, a lot of quarantine tanks aren't cycled out. Sometimes they are, but more often than not, they're not cycled. Or if they are cycled, it's just, it's just kind of cycled. Um, I'm just reading chat here for a second, make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, but going back to what I started to say, um, I get it why they're, they're giving that advice. A lot of aquariums, a lot of quarantine tanks aren't fully cycled, and if you're feeding fish heavily, your ammonia's gonna spike, blah, 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 blah. Okay, still, that is very bad advice. Okay, when, when a fish comes out of a fish store, let's assume that its stress level is zero. Okay, it's, it's got zero stress in its life. It's happy, it's been fed. It's caught in a net, it's plopped in a bag, it's tied up. Stress reading one, right? Stress just went up. There's a stressor, it's stressed out, it just got freaked out, it's in a bag now, and it doesn't know what the heck's going on or where it is, right? Now, let's say that uh, you drive across town with it. Maybe you drive 50 miles with the fish. Maybe you box it up and you ship it. This fish is under some pretty serious stress. It doesn't know what's going on. It's frightened right now, okay? Stressor number two, it's in the bag, it's not getting fed. Might be a day, might be several days, okay? Now let's say now you receive the fish, you crack the box open, you take it out of the bag, you know, it looks okay, it's healthy, um, you plop it into a, uh, a tank, whether it's a quarantine tank or whatever, it's kind of irrelevant. Okay, new tank, brand new tank, totally stressed out, stressor number three. And now we get to that bad advice, keep it in a quarantine tank and don't feed it for a week while you're treating it with, in a lot of, in a lot of cases, pretty harsh medications like Levamisole, um, some of these anti-parasitic medications can be pretty harsh. Some antibiotics are pretty harsh. Levamisole, that's pretty harsh on a fish, you know. You're treating th these meds with these harsh medications and you're not feeding it for a week. Well, there you go, there's the final stressor. So I guarantee you, if you're quarantining fish for a week or more and you're not feeding them, you are going to lose fish, not just because they were sick, in fact, I'll go so far as to say that if you're, if you're starving your fish out for a whole week, that very well could be the main cause that you're losing so many fish. You need to feed your fish. Now, I'll stop with that. Hopefully you guys will hear me out the rest of the way. This DIY quarantine tank setup is cool because um, you can set it up uh, for, I think the, the YouTube card said, uh, Set it up for pennies. Well, it's not pennies, but it's just a few bucks. It's really cheap. It's a great way to have an on-demand, it's not very nice to look at, but it's a, it's a really effective on-demand quarantine tank. And you can go in ahead and medicate that water all you want. You can put all the antibiotics, all the levamisole you want. You can hit it with Paracleanse. Go on ahead and dump straight up amoxicillin in there if you need to, or some kind of penicillin-based antibiotic. Those are nuclear weapons with, with biological filtration. It will absolutely toast your filtration. Go on ahead and put all those in there. It's not going to affect the filtration. So without any further delay, let me switch over 
to my audio, my hissy audio mic. And then I will switch over to the walkabout cam and we'll get started. Bear with me, guys. There we go. Should be really nice and hissy now. Hey, all right. Now we're on the, as I call it, the walkabout cam, which is just, this is just my phone, actually. So I am going to show you guys how easy it is to put one of these together. We're gonna go over the materials that you need. Um, you can get, now, now I made it before I start, I made it a point to source uh, Aquion stuff and Imagitarium, just really, really easy to find stuff at, at really any big box store, any local fish store. You should be able to find these parts, which is why I use them to make, to, you know, so you guys kind of understand just how readily available this stuff is. So let's get started. This is your quarantine tank. It's not much to look at, but it's on demand. Okay, now I went with a Sterilite, a sterilite uh, plastic bin, right? It's got everything in it that you need to build this, and we're gonna get started. Uh, I think I paid, I don't know, $5 or something for this at a big, big box store. It's made out of clear plastic, and it's got this cool lid that attaches, you see these hinges? It attaches there, just snaps in. It's got this cool lid that kind of interlocks when you close it. Now this is your on-demand quarantine tank. This is what you're gonna set up just like, you know, 10, 20, 30 minutes before, I don't know, like right before you go to the fish store to get new fish, set this up and I'm gonna show you how to do it. Okay, what you need is a heater. Okay, this is a little 50 watt heater. Um, this is more than enough. I have used this very same tiny 50 watt heater to push 20 long aquariums to 86 degrees and it held it there. So all you need is a little Aquion 50 watt heater Okay, you're gonna need a power strip, just one, that's all you need. Air stone, okay, we're getting to the cool part, just hear me out, this is real basic, like duh stuff right now. Need an air stone, a little bit of air tubing, okay? An air pump, okay, this is, this is a Tetra Whisper. Um, supposedly the best air pump in the world, I doubt that, I don't think Tetra makes any good equipment anymore. Um, but you do need an air pump. It doesn't have to be fancy. Let me talk about this. A lot of medications, especially antibiotics, okay, have a tendency to starve uh, fish of oxygen, okay? It messes with oxygen absorption in water and uh, oxygen uptake by fish gills. So anytime you have a quarantine tank set up or you're, you're treating fish with medications, Always make sure you are oxygenating the water. Don't, you know, just rely on a little hang on the back filter to, uh, to um, you know, push enough oxygen there because it's, it's not going to. Okay, so we got that. Now here's where we get to the, to the cool stuff. Here's, here's the filtration hack. What you're going to do is you're going to go down and you're going to get yourself one of these or something like it. This is the Aquion Quiet Flow 10 internal quote-unquote shrimp filter which is ridiculous this is it's a terrible filter to use for shrimp but it's perfect for for us because you see it's submersible it goes on the inside of the tank and basically water just kind of gets gets drawn up kind of gets drawn up into the bottom of it and then an, an engine just pushes it out so what you're going to do is this let me show you how to do this see if i can open this up this aside. You're going to get your little filter out. See, it's all, I haven't even opened it up yet, guys. Fresh props. All right. Take your filter out. You see, this is where the, this is where the water enters it. And then a little engine pushes it the rest of the way out. Okay. It comes with this. See this? Get rid of it. See this? This little thing here, get rid of it. You get this little thing and you put it back in there how it was, just like that. So it's literally just an empty box with this little guard. Put it in the front, just like that, okay? We're gonna set this aside. It, it, by the way, it, always, it, it already comes with these little 
these little suction cups on it. It comes with another uh, couple of suction cups and little, little hanging things. You don't want to use these hanging things. You do, though, want to use your suction cups because it's how we're going to affix this to our, um, to our container. Let's see if I can get this put on. There we go. There's one. Of course, the other one on here. Just like that. Okay, so we got four suction cups. There we go. Now it's on. Okay, and we set this aside. Next, and this is where the hack is. Okay, we're hacking this filter. You're going to get one of these. This is an Imagitarium mesh media filter bag. It was like two bucks, three bucks, right? You don't need a big one. You just get it out like this. Okay? And what you're gonna do, this is the space it's gonna fit in, okay? We're gonna fill this with something called a zeolite. Now normally, zeolite is kept for emergencies, emergency reasons. While I get this unscrewed and I get ready to use so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about zeolite. Zeolite is a weird substance. Basically, it comes from the ground uh, it's a mineral. It really is a mineral, but it's highly porous. Now, depending on the grade of zeolite, some of it is for fresh water. Some of it's for fresh water and salt water. Some of it is not rated for aquarium use at all. This is a magitarium zeolite crystals. It's very, very cheap. This is rated for fresh water. Okay, you see? Fresh water. Do not get a uh, cheap zeolite that's not even rated for filtration because it will not work, okay? Zeolite has a very weird property. I've talked about this, I don't know, maybe about two or three weeks ago. It's got a very strange property. Basically, what it does is it's, it's always looking to perform something called ion exchange. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put some in here, and the reason why we're gonna do that is because zeolite is an absolute champ at eating ammonia. Nothing will quite absorb ammonia like zeolite will. It is really something else at eating ammonia. What it does is it actually, well, let me, let me correct myself. It doesn't really eat ammonia, it absorbs it. And the way it does that is like I said, ion exchange. When zeolite comes into contact with ammonia, what it does is it, it, it immediately absorbs it and locks it up and it exchanges it for an ion of sodium. Now I didn't say salt, I said sodium, right? Now we're losing a little bit of this, that's fine. But what you wanna do is pack your, your filter media bag with zeolite, okay? Keep it all in more or less in one place. And then what you're gonna do is you wanna put it in here. Let me see if I can do this. I can't do it while I hold the camera. Just like this. Just gonna fit in there, just like that. And just twist this up. I actually have a little bit too much in there. Just like that. So what's gonna happen is that this filter is at the bottom right there where my thumb is. It's gonna, water's uh, automatically going to be drawn in right there. And then it's gonna fill up with water to about right there. And then what happens is there's a little internal pump that pushes the water the rest of the way out. And then it just keeps sucking more and more water in. So as that's happening, your fish are in, let's, let's go ahead and, Stick this to the side here. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Just like that. I've actually got too much zeolite in there. I'll take some, some out. But basically, you just want to stick it to the side with the little suction cups. Then you want to fill it up to about, you know, about right there or so. And then all you got to do is plug this in. Just gotta plug this in. And then it's automatically gonna start running, right? You've got your, you've got your filter installed here. 
and you've got your, your little air stone in here. Something cool about these is they come with these little holes already in them right here. So you can easily run a piece of uh, airline tubing up through here and down with your, you know, with your air stone on it. No problem. So what this is doing is as it draws in fish waste or water with fish waste in it, including medications, because this is a, this is a, uh, this is a quarantine tank, right? The zeolite, as soon as ammonia contacts it, it's going to bind to that ammonia. It's going gonna, it's gonna to suck it up immediately, and it's going to release one, so, one sodium ion for each ion of ammonia it releases. Now, I said sodium ion, not salt, right? Sodium, not salt. Sodium is a metal anyways. So the presence of, of sodium ions in water is not a problem for freshwater fish. Where you have to start being careful is when you start getting into sodium chloride ions, too, too many sodium chloride ions. Now you're, now you're playing with fire. So what you do is you run this, right? And all it does is it sits there and as soon as, as, soon as, it, it, uh, as, soon as ammonia hits it, pow, it, it just sucks it up, no problem. And it releases a sodium ion in its place. Now, what... The reason why this is so helpful and so cool is that medications don't affect it. Medic no medications that you can see. For instance, canamycin sulfate. I use this all the time because I import fish. Sometimes fish come in, they're sick. You got to treat them. This will absolutely impact your bacterial bed and your biofilters. Similarly, so will this. Nitrofurazone. It's a very, very powerful antibiotic. Again, your biological bacterial beds will be affected by that. Here's another one. Typically does not affect filter beds, metronidazole, but what metronidazole, what metronidazole does do is it does impact some of the bacteria that make up the aquarium's microbiological biome, which is a lot of times when you use metro, you know, your, your biological filter's fine, but your aquarium's cloudy, like really cloudy for like two or three weeks afterwards. That's because it didn't affect the filter bed, but it did kill off some of the bacteria, all of which are a part of the biome of your aquarium, so it's, it's off balance now. Here's another really bad one. Remember I mentioned the nuclear weapon? Amoxicillin. This is a nuclear weapon. There's really not much that it won't cure. It won't treat uh, hexamida or lateral line disease or hole in the head, but there's not a whole lot else that it won't treat. Now, amoxicillin is basically a flamethrower for any biological filter. Now, if you're using an ion exchange filter, all of this stuff is in play. No problem, no problem at all. Go on ahead and use whatever you want. It's not going to affect this filter. This filter will reliably eat ammonia like crazy. Now, it does have its limits. It can't eat ammonia forever, guys. Okay, so what you want to do, if you have a lot of fish in here, a lot of fish in here, let's say you get, I don't know, let's say you got 30 neon tetras, 35 neon tetras in here. You got, you know, water in here. It's running. You're feeding them, you know, you're feeding them once a day. Remember I talked about building your fish up every chance you get. Please don't. Starve them for one week just to quarantine them. That's not good. This, this, in fact, this filter is going to eat every bit of ammonia they produce. Don't worry about it. Now, you can run this for six days. And then after six days, you need to take this zeolite out and recharge it. How do you recharge it? Okay, I'm going to tell you right now. What you do is you, here, you get, you get a container like this, right? You get a container like this, guys. Sorry about the camera freaking out there for a second. And you put a little bit of water in here like that. Just maybe, you know, it's like, I don't know, half a liter. I go with like half a liter. And in this, you're going to put like a bunch of salt, like a bunch of salt, non-iodized salt, just regular salt. Just go down and get you some kosher salt, get you some rock salt, whatever. You're going you're gonna to put like half a liter of water in there. You're going to put a bunch of salt. I mean, we're talking, you know, 10 tablespoons like eight tablespoons of salt, maybe 10, like tons of salt in there. You're gonna mix it up like crazy. Just mix it, mix it, mix it, mix it until all the salt's dissolved. Go on ahead and taste some. It should be incredibly salty, like real salty, like eight to 10 tablespoons, heaping tablespoons of salt in a half liter of water. Then you're gonna take this out, right? Sorry about that. You're gonna take it out. 
You're going to put it in there. And you're going to make sure it's fully submerged in that salt solution, that clear salt solution, for four hours. Four hours. Okay? You want to make sure that it's fully submerged in that salt solution and leave it alone. Don't stir it up. Don't, don't pray to it. Don't, don't threaten it. Just leave it alone. It'll do its thing. And after four hours, you're going to come back. And that clear, salty solution will not be clear anymore. It's going to be milky, yellow, kind of like a... It, it looks like milk that's off, like slightly yellow milk. And it'll smell like death. Now, what that is, is that's pure ammonia and fish waste that the zeolite has now released. What has happened is that ion exchange has occurred back in the other direction. You see? Back in the other direction. It has released all of that ammonia, taken on new sodium, okay? And it's ready to go. It's ready to go. You just put it back in there. You're good for another six days. So, think of it this way. You can run this for six days, and then on the seventh day is your day of rest. That's when you need to recharge this for the four hours. Turn it off, okay? Take that. Recharge it in your very, very salty solution for four hours. Then take it out of the salty solution in the bag just like this. Rinse it under tap water. Boop. Put it right back in. Turn the filter back on. You're good for another six days. Again, this is your second time. Remember, every six days, you need to recharge it. So what you're going to do is you're going you're to run that for, you know, 14 days, maybe 21 days. Remember, the rule is, is you, can, you need to recharge this on the seventh day because that is when usually it starts to max out on its ability to absorb ammonia. Now, when it maxes out on its ability to absorb ammonia, you're in big trouble if you have not been keeping up with recharging it. A lot of people don't even bother to recharge zeolite because it's so cheap, it's so affordable. You can go down and get uh, an entire, you know, an entire thing of it for, for relatively cheap. So after the sixth day, you know, some people don't even recharge it. They just, they just throw it out and they just put more zeolite in there, you know, good to go for another week. You know, I think a whole container of this was maybe $8 or something. I, I can't even remember, but it's very affordable. Now, again, I want to turn around and go back to something. I love DIY. I love hacking stuff. Uh, I love saving a buck. Uh, I love science. I, I love hacking this hobby. Now, one thing not to do. Remember, I said not all zeolite is created equal. Now, there's some, some stuff online you're going to come across that says, wait a minute, kitty litter contains zeolite. Yes, it does. It does contain zeolite. And it's completely the wrong grade for this. It, it has almost no ability to pull ammonia out of a water column. It's not the correct grade of zeolite for that. So please, when you get some zeolite, if you want to try this, go on ahead, but make sure you're using freshwater zeolite. Okay, don't, don't try to hack the zeolite. Just, just get good zeolite, and you should have good, uh, good results. So again, you know, you just want to run that. Um, run it for as long as you need, right? You're going to run it. Um, you know, seven days, 10 days. That's usually what I quarantine fish for, 10 days. You want to run it for two weeks? Go on ahead and run it for two weeks. You want to run it for 30 days? Go on ahead. But the great thing about this is, is that you don't care about biological filtration at all. Who cares uh, that, you know, when you're done with quarantining your fish, you're just going to break it down, dry everything, and put it in the top of a closet and be done with your quarantine tank until you need it next time. That's kind of the beauty of the setup is that who cares about your biological filtration? This doesn't leverage biological filtration at all. Now, let me sit down and switch back over to the regular camera and see, see how much I've missed in chat. Probably tons. There we go. All right, let me fix the mic. Okay, guys, there we go. That audio should be quite a bit better. Bear with me while I go over and I see what I missed. Oh, I definitely see some, uh, some comments here. Okay, I see a comment from EJ Fishes 76 EJ Fishes 76 asks, do you fully submerge that filter? Also, how many times can zeolite be recharged? No, you don't fully uh, submerge that filter. Let me go grab it and I'll show you.
Oops. Okay. Let me uh, switch over. There we go. So here's the filter. Okay. This is just a little, it's got little suction cups on it, right? It's got intake at the bottom and you, you suction cup it to the side of your aquarium or your bin or whatever you're using, right? And you fill the water up to about right there, right? The lip is here. The water level should be about right there, okay? As long as this is, is underwater and, you know, you've got it filled to about right there, the little tiny engine in the bottom is going to drag water and force it in and then force it out. No problem at all. Um, and as it comes up and out, it's running through all of those zeolite crystals. And those zeolite crystals are absolutely stripping ammonia out of the water column. Let's see what the next question is here. Yeah, that's exactly it. Not Nola Jane Fishrich said it. It's just a little internal filter. Right, that's exactly it. Um, w. Marion with a question. Six days for one to two cups of zeolite and approximately 10 gallon tank with 30 fish. Shorter period of time if more fish or less zeolite? Uh, no, uh, no, actually, if uh, zeolite, um, let me put it this way, for a tin, it's, it's recommended if you want to run zeolite for like to strip ammonia out of water, out of water column, it's recommended that for every, I think it's 10 gallons of water, you only use half a cup of zeolite, very little. Like there's way more zeolite in that bag than you need it. And that's what you should do. Go on ahead and put more zeolite than you need in there because uh, if you're using more than you need, who cares? It's really, really cheap. You don't want to use less than you need, you see? Because if you use less than you need, then it might absorb ammonia for several days, maybe four or five days, and then it's maxed out. Well, that's not good. So as long as you use, you know, let's say for 10 gallons of water, use half a cup or more, you're going to be fine. Uh, this stuff absorbs ammonia like a champ. Now, this, I, I do want to uh, make a disclaimer here. This is a temporary setup system, okay? This is not permanent. Do not, please don't run a permanent zeolite ion exchange filter. It's just, it's, it's not the best way to run a permanent solution. Biological filtration is what you want to do for a permanent solution. Now, with that said, ion exchange is very powerful when you're kind of between a rock and a hard place. Like you got to use a bunch of meds, a bunch of antibiotics. You're going to toast your, your biological filtration. So, for those situations, it's more than appropriate to use an ion exchange filter. And all it takes at its heart is good quality zeolite that you're taking care of and you're making sure that, you know, you, char you recharge it when you, when you need to or you just replace it even better. Now let me go on up and see what else I've missed. Probably tons. Oh, wow, we've only got 15 minutes left. I cannot believe how quickly time has flown this time. Uh, Loria99 with a question here. Does the bioload affect the number of days you can go before it maxes out? Technically, yes. Technically, yes. But in that little filter mesh bag, I probably put a cup and a half in there. Uh, man, you're going to have a really hard time maxing out a cup and a half of fresh zeolite in 10 gallons of water. Uh, I don't even think that you can probably fit enough fish in that, uh, enough fish in that space to toast a cup and a half of zeolite in six days. I, I don't see it happening. Um, so again, like in a small filter like this, you know, I would recommend go about a cup. Go about a cup of zeolite, fresh zeolite in there, fresh water rated zeolite, and a little mesh, mesh bag. You saw how the zeolite was coming out of my mesh bag. You might want to learn from that. Get a little bit finer mesh bag for your setup. Um, not that that will cause any problems, but um, it's a little messy. Uh, go on ahead and pack it with about a cup of zeolite. You know, fill it with 10 gallons of water. Make sure you measure out your water, by the way, guys. I wanted to say, when you're setting one of these little bins up for the first time, please use an empty one gallon, like, water jug, like an empty jug, and measure out five gallons. Pour five gallons into that thing, and then use a magic marker and write on the side a little line where that water line is and write 5G. Then add, you know, five more gallons and make another line 10G. There you go. You just measured out the volume that it needs to sit at. Now you know how much water it has in it. Why is that important? If you don't know how much water it has in it, how can you dose accurately, right? How can you dose your fish with medication if you don't know how much water is in the thing? So, 
Another little word of advice there. It's probably common sense to just about everybody here, but I thought that uh, I would point it out. Please remember to at Redfish Bluefish uh, with any specific questions, comments, anything like that, please. Mel Hitt is here with a great question. So do you need a quarantine tank for saltwater fish? Yes, absolutely you do. You need a quarantine tank for all fish, my friend. Uh, corals, I'm not, I don't, well, I'm not a big coral guy. Uh, some friends of mine are big coral heads. I don't know if corals carry diseases. I imagine that if plants can carry pathogens into your aquarium, then corals can too. Uh, but absolutely. Got some hidden, hidden comments here. I had to unhide them. You keep going up and see if I've missed anything. I don't think so. There we go. Um, oh, we got another question here from Kevin Leong. Kevin Leong asks, what are you looking for in the filter you get, and do you pre-treat with meds whenever you get the fish or just when you see an issue? Okay, so the kind of filter you're looking for is an internal filter, okay, just an internal power filter. You want something with a basin in it, like that. Like any of the Aquion, what do they call them? The, the horrible line that they make? The Aquion Quiet Flow, like the small Quiet Flows. They make a Quiet Flow E, uh, this is a Quiet Flow Shrimp, whatever this thing is called. You just want an internal hang on the back filter with an intake that sits below the water line. That's it, anything. It can be this big, it can be half the size. The idea is you just want, you just want a device it's going to force water to flow across and through the zeolite. Whether it's internal, hey, if maybe you don't use, here's, a, here's, a, here's an idea, maybe you don't want to use a plastic bin. Maybe you want to use an actual aquarium. Cool, use an aquarium, fine. And maybe you want to use a hang on the back filter. Whatever, no problem, go on ahead and go down and get a, a El Cheapo Aquion hang on the back filter, maybe a cheap pin plaques, whatever, as long as it's cheap and take the cartridges out, put a media bag in there that's full of fresh zeolite crystals, turn it on, you're done. You're done, you've just changed that from a mechanical biological filter to a mechanical ion exchange filter. We're not doing a biological conversion anymore, we're doing ionic capture, right? The zeolite's capturing ammonia and holding onto it and releasing in its place ions of sodium. Not salt, but sodium. You know, ammonia in, sodium out. Ammonia in, sodium out. It's not a problem for freshwater fish. In fact, I don't know any fish that are that sensitive to sodium to where it would just, it would just toast them. So, um, I think I may have missed some of the question. What are you looking for in the filter? So just an internal, any kind of filter that draws water in and puts it out, you know, that can put it across the zeolite crystals. And do you pre-treat with meds whenever you get fish or just when you see an issue? It depends. I can't really say more than that, but it depends. Some fish species are very problematic, okay? Have you imported neon tetras or cardinal tetras? You had better treat them immediately, right away. Don't wait for them to get sick because when they get sick, they're all going to get sick and you're going to lose 30% of them at once, like that. And then you treat them, and then the next day, you've lost another 30% of them. And then the next day after that, they finally started to respond to the medications. Neon tetras especially, and to a lesser degree, cardinal tetras, and in fact, small rasboras, like really small rasboras, they pick up what I call bacterial stress infections, okay? They get really stressed out, they're in the bag, there's some ammonia in the bag, they, they're freaked out, they don't know what's going on. That has a wholesale lowering effect of their immune system. Now, there's poop in the bag. There's bacteria in the bag. They're breathing bacteria, and guess what? With a weakened immune system and stress, in some fish, not all, but some fish, the bacteria takes hold, now they're sick. And now you get them out of your tank, put them in your aquarium, now you have a sick aquarium. So again, it depends on the fish. Some fish are much more problematic than others. Some fish don't travel well. Some killifish ship very poorly. Rasboras are another very poor shipper for the most part. So it really depends, Kevin. I, I wish there was a formula. 
And you're very welcome, Kevin. Thank you for the thanks. I'm going to go down and see if I've uh, missed anything. Dragon Lair. Ah, here we go with a great comment from Dragon Lair. Thank you so much, Patrick, for pointing that out. Many fish keepers don't realize a 10-gallon tank actually doesn't hold exactly 10 gallons depending on how full you fill it. Dosing some meds may need to be adjusted. Very true. And let me do you a better one. Okay, a lot of people don't realize that hardscape also affects volume of water, right? So if you've got a bunch of rocks in an aquarium, <laughs> that's taking up water volume, right? So you might not need to dose an aquarium for 10 gallons, you might need to dose it for nine. You need to pay attention to these things, right? Now, luckily, a lot of medications aren't aren't that sensitive to where, you know, if you, if you dosed it for 10 gallons, you really only had nine and a half gallons in there, poof, everything's dead. That's usually not the case, luckily. So, I got a great comment here from Dean's Fish Room. Thanks so much, Dean. Uh, Dean says, hi, Jason. In my experience, using zeolite like this can cause huge pH swings. Yes, it can. Uh, usually raising the pH. This, of course, depends upon your water's buffering ability. Very good point, yes. You can raise the pH of the water depending on your water chemistry, right? So if, if you don't have any buffer at all in your, in your aquarium, let's, let's say your carbonate is zero. Like you have no carbonate whatsoever in your water. Well, now your water isn't buffered whatsoever. Like, so if you have no carbonate in your water, it would take very little, very little uh, adding anything acidic or adding anything alkaline to rock that pH up or down because you don't have any buffering capability in your water at all. Now, with that said, easily 90% of the United States, if not more, has pretty decent water that's not going to move with the addition of zeolite because most municipal water supplies, they have a carbonate additive that they're putting in it. They're also adding, adding general hardness. You know, they're, they're treating water. They're, they don't just add chlorine to water and send it down the pipe. No, 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 that's not what they do. They add carbonate, they add general hardness, they add, they're, they're additives that they're putting in the water. Now, very good point from Dean's Fish Room. Zeolite can raise the pH of water if you have virtually no buffering capability at all. Why? I already gave you the answer to it, right? It takes in an ion of ammonia and it releases an ion of what? Sodium. Well, what does sodium do? It raises the pH. Now, with that said, if your water has some carbonate in it, it's, it shouldn't raise the pH really very much at all. Now, if you're keeping fish in rainwater, it probably will raise your pH. So let me see what else I missed here. Ah, we got a question, it looks like, from W. Marion. Was there any news related to the new fish for the shop? I missed the beginning. No need to recap. Unfortunately, no. Uh, we do have some stuff coming in, but I'm keeping that kind of hush-hush hush, hush secret uh, for, for, a, for a big reveal uh, down the line. Uh, Deborah Sanders with a comment. I like my cheap Aquion hang on the back. It's quiet. I don't use the filters. Put in my own media. Tetra air pumps work fine, too. Deborah Sanders, absolutely. I have Aquion hang on the back filters in this very shop right now. They're great value for money because out of the bag, or out of the box, I should say, the pumps are submersed. They're already under the surface of the water, right? Which means you don't have to prime the pumps. You don't have to prime them at all. You just have to plug them in. They start taking the water in, put it right out, and they're really affordable. Now, you know, are there better filters? Sure. Sure, um, the Seachem Tidal uh, hang on the back filters are beasts. Uh, those are probably some of the best hang on the back filters in the world. I just wish that they didn't look so Soviet. So let me, let me scroll up here and see if I've missed anything. Uh, we got a comment from OLY Fish Guy. Hey bud, I just wondered why you deleted my comment, which was first. I just said hello and congrats. I didn't delete your comment at all. No one deleted your comment, OLY fish guy. Um, I didn't see any comment uh, from you whatsoever. So I am not sure uh, why YouTube or what happened there. 
Um, but I'm giving you a shout out now. Uh, thanks for the comment. Uh, Oli, it's either Oli Fish Guy, Oli Fish Guy, O L Y Fish Guy. Anyway, here's your shout out, and uh, thanks for coming by and participating. So let me go down and see if I have missed anything else at all. Yes, Dragon Lair, there you go. There's a there's a decent uh, decent comment there. A tablespoon or so of crushed coral mixed into the zeolite will help mitigate the rise in pH. Yes, it's very correct. Deborah Sanders with a comment. My water comes from aquifers, very low KH. Wow. Um, hmm. Well, my water comes out of an aquifer as well, and it's it's got some some pretty decent carbonate uh, out of the box. Um, yeah, that's that's weird. Dean's Fish Room here with a comment. Uh, I use a well-established sponge filter and do partial water changes each day. Yes, some drugs will kill some of the beneficial bacteria, but the water changes will keep everything in check. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's, again, it depends on depends on what you're using. If, if, if you get something, you get a fish in with something really nasty, something very fast moving, and you have to use a nuclear weapon like amoxicillin, I guarantee you all the bacteria in your filter are gone gone like that or like 100 percent of them so again it really depends on what we're treating with luckily luckily amoxicillin is typically not something that you're going to treat fish with it's you would use amoxicillin for very fast aerobic uh very fast moving things we're talking strep uh flesh eating things really nasty pathogens that is when the big guns like amoxicillin come out now, if you do have to pull amoxicillin out, it's going to be a bad day to be a, a, an ammonia-eating bacteria in your aquarium because it will, it will absolutely flamethrow them. They will be gone. Um, so, again, it's not a one-size-fix-all solution. However, if you are um, kind of hard up for space and you're not into running a, a constant quarantine tank, right, and you want one that's on demand, something that's going to easily do the job, eat ammonia like crazy out of your aquarium, you might consider putting together an on-demand little kind of bin system like we just put together here, one that uses ion exchange to eat ammonia out of an aquarium as opposed to biological filtration. Now, um, with that said, the disclaimer I will leave you with is that a zeolite-based filtration system is not permanent. You should not run that as a permanent solution. It is not as, as a permanent fix for anything. It is, zeolite is very helpful to use, to have and to use in, in an ammonia emergency, like an ammonia spike. It's also great to use uh, for an on-demand ammonia eating DIY quarantine tank, one that's not affected by medication. So with that said, guys, I really appreciate you coming by and hanging out. Uh, you've been watching Redfish, Bluefish, um, we're going to wrap it up here, um, and I'd like to thank all of my moderators for participating, and each and every single one of you for coming by, and for participating, for for throwing out your you know your own tips and tricks, and and kind of participating in the in the information and idea sharing. Uh, that's really what what fuels YouTube, and that's why I'm here. So with that said, really appreciate it, guys. You've been watching Redfish Bluefish. I wish you all peace love and happy fish keeping.